Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kristina Hrybkova. I'm a counsel uh, at Integritas International Arbitration and Cross-Border Litigation Team based in Kyiv and in Brussels. I'm privileged to moderate today's discussion on the topic Building a Career in International Arbitration, which I'm sure uh, will be fruitful and insightful for the audience. I'm sure that those who uh, attended the arbitration school organized by the Ukrainian Arbitration Association, you learned a lot and enjoyed uh, the uh, lectures. Now on, uh, moving on to our topics in our discussion. International arbitration is a unique and rewarding practice area. In parallel, arbitration is a competitive and demanding field and quite challenging uh, to break into as a result. Students, uh, junior lawyers just beginning their career uh, during the pandemic era, uh, they will face some new challenges in addition to those uh, which existed previously. We are here today to give you some practical advice on how to get a new job and to overcome pitfalls while building your career in international arbitration. Uh, we decided to invite a diverse panel today and diverse not only in terms of gender, but also in terms of uh, the locations of the speakers, jurisdictions of their qualification, professional roles, experience, and unique routes they have taken to succeed in international arbitration and enhance their profiles. Although I will be brief in introducing the speakers, uh, I would strongly encourage that everyone in the audience uh, look up uh, at their extensive profiles and uh, truly appreciate the extensive experience, expertise and contributions into international arbitration. Our first speaker is Steven Finitza, who is a partner at Wilmer Hale International Arbitration and Dispute Resolution Group in London. He has immense experience uh, of acting as counsel under the rules of leading international arbitration institutions and in ad hoc proceedings, uh, involving the laws of different jurisdictions in Europe, in Asia, Africa, the South America, and the US. He acts for clients in, in, in international investment and commercial cases. Stephen has assisted in drafting arbitration legislation and also sits as an arbitrator. He teaches international arbitration as an adjunct professor at Source University in London. Among his publications are a practical guide to international commercial arbitration, assessment, planning and strategy, and international commercial arbitration. I had a pleasure of working with Steve during my time at Wilmer Hale, and I'm particularly delighted to see him today uh, in our panel. Our next speaker is Juliana Janko, is a partner at Onetio and Vandenberg in Belgium, focusing on international arbitration. Uh, Juliana has worked in several dozen high profile and complex international commercial and investment cases, both ad hoc and under leading arbitration uh, rules. Juliana is a member of the ICC Commission on Arbitration and ADR, ICA, and the CEPANI. She is a member of the ICC Working Group on Leveraging Technology for Fair, Effective and Efficient International Arbitration Proceedings. Our next speaker is Dr. Krina Baltak, who is a senior lecturer in international arbitration at Stockholm University. She holds, its P she holds a PhD degree in international arbitration. Krina is also a qualified attorney at law since 2004 with extensive practice in various aspects on international dispute resolution, private and public international law. Uh, Krina also sits uh, as an arbitrator, and I'm truly impressed uh, by Krina's publications, among which the Energy Charter Treaty, the notion of investor, and exit convention after 50 years, unsettled issues. Uh, in addition, Krina is the editor of Kluver Arbitration Blog, I'm sure everyone is familiar uh, with that, and co-managing editor of ETA Arbitration Report. Moving on to Peter Riesnik, who is a senior associate at Conrad Partners Arbitration Practice, and he's based in Vienna. Previously, he worked, uh, he worked as a tribunal secretary in investment and commercial arbitrations, 
And also he's a member of the ICC Commission on Arbitration and ADR and, it, and its task force on addressing issues of corruption in international arbitration. Uh, Peter regularly serves as an arbitrator and part, party representative in international arbitrations. Uh, he also hosts Vienna Arbitration Talk, a series of interviews on hot topics in international arbitration. And I definitely urge students to check it out. The interviews are high quality product indeed. Last but not least, please welcome Thomas Weil, who since uh, 2019 leads the team uh, at uh, Weil Dispute Resolution, which is an independent dispute practice based in London. Uh, with over a decade of arbitration experience gained at uh, Freshfields and Widen Case, Thomas is a recognized and leading arbitration practitioner. He regularly represents both claimants and respondents in commercial and investor state arbitrations and sit as, uh, as arbitrator. Thomas' uh, recent experience includes uh, acting on behalf of an investor in an exit claim against Belarus and on behalf of an investor in the Energy Charter Treaty claim against Ukraine. I think uh, the claim was filed just two days ago. So very excited to see the development of this case. Before we start, a couple of housekeeping rules. We will use a Q&A format where I will post questions to the panelists. We actually received some questions from the audience in advance to this webinar. So I, I will be happy to pose those questions to the speakers. Uh, at the same time, the audience is highly encouraged to write down your questions in the chat on YouTube, and we will try to address them in the course of discussion. The event will, be last, uh, the, the event will last for one hour, and will be recorded and posted on YouTube. Now, as a starting point, I am inviting our panelists to, to share their career stories. What drew you uh, to the worlds of international arbitration and whether you had or still have mentors along your way? Who would like to pick? I'll start because I unmuted myself. <laughs> no, thank you very much, uh, Christina. And, and just a quick, uh, quick note on this. I'm, I'm uh, very happy to be in a panel with uh, very close friends. So uh, that's a great opportunity to see everybody today. Um, I, I, I would, I would not focus on my career, like describing it, because you mentioned some points. But uh, I, I would highlight uh, probably what I think it's important uh, or what made the difference. Um, uh, first of all, I, I started at the time when arbitration was not what it is today, uh, was kind of unknown, uh, internet was not something that uh, everybody could rely on, uh, access to resources to the network uh, was not what it is today. So uh, 15 years ago, uh, 16 years ago, uh, or even more, uh, there was uh, not so many opportunities that are now today. and. Um, and what made the difference is that um, I studied arbitration undergraduate at the University of Bucharest, which was something kind of unusual for that time, especially for a, a, a communist country like Romania, uh, where there was no international trade in place and uh, no uh, private dispute resolution mechanism uh, uh, encouraged. Um, and, and after I graduated, I qualified as a lawyer. And I think for everything that uh, followed that moment, uh, having the experience as a transactional lawyer and also as a, a arbitration and litigation lawyer made or completed my, my understanding or pushed me to the direction where I am today. So I think this is one, one point in my career uh, that probably has to be highlighted, the practical experience, whatever you want to do. Uh, if you're planning to be an arbitrator at the later stage of your career, if you want to go uh, to the academia or whatever you want to do, the practical experience is very important. Thank you, Krina. Shall I dare to follow? Sure, sure. Uh, so um, I studied like Karina at the University of Bucharest. Um, but when I studied, I don't think there was a specific course on arbitration as far as I remember. So maybe they changed the curriculum in the meantime. So my first exposure to arbitration was actually through work. I was working as counsel during dispute resolution at a boutique law firm in Bucharest. 
And most of the time that meant that I was appearing in court proceedings. So that meant that you had 20 minutes uh, in front of a judge in a crowded uh, hearing room trying to put forward your case uh, and the judge is rushed because they have many, many other cases to go through and you wish you could argue all of the beautiful arguments that you thought of before, but you just don't have the time. Uh, so at the time when I was doing this, there was a, a large arbitration, a commercial arbitration that came in. And um, the fact that we could just focus on our written submissions and fully explain our case and then prepare for a hearing that lasted longer than one hour um, was amazing to me because I thought that it provided this opportunity of really delving into a case of really understanding legal questions, understanding the facts behind the case and the people who were working in it. I found the experience of working with witness, uh, witnesses in particular fascinating just to, it just gave you a completely different perspective about a case. So I, I liked how arbitration just combined these two aspects, the, the, the practical aspect of seeing the actual case and what happened, but also the opportunity to fully develop legal questions. And that's how I became hooked. <laughs> I guess I can jump into the silence. I I I hesitated because I have even more gray hair than everyone else on on this group. And so when Karina said arbitration was wasn't uh, what it is today when she started, that was even more true when I started. And so my path is not a path that people take today so much. But I, what I would highlight about my path was, I like many people here, I didn't really know arbitration as a law student. I, I, di I didn't really know it as a, a lawyer in the early part of my career. I started as a litigator. But what I did do when the opportunity came along to do international arbitration was I was willing to move. I moved from the US to London um, and took a huge risk at that point in upending my career to follow that opportunity. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that we'll, as we expand on the questions that people have and talk about this, we will need to talk about is, is, is what do you need to do if opportunities come along and how do you craft your path to try to maximize creating those opportunities? Because there's a certain amount of luck because we're still talking about a, a boutique area of practice, a, a smaller area of practice. And so opportunity, you can't always make the opportunities. And so seizing them and, and assessing them, deciding whether they're worth the risks and what the, the pros and cons are, I think is a critical part of, of building a career in arbitration. So I, I'm happy to talk about that later on. But I think that for me was the big thing. I was willing to move from the US um, out of a litigation practice to London to be an international practice in order to, to pursue the opportunity. Um, I'll echo some of the, the things we've heard. Uh, as a law student, I was not familiar with arbitration either. I was more focused actually on international human rights law at the time. And actually that is, I do hear that not, it's not uncommon for arbitration practitioners to start with an interest in human rights. Um, I think it has to do with the relevance of international conventions, overarching principles of law, uh, to decouple from national law as well. So I have that background. I also moved, uh, like Stevens mentioned, uh, but it was part of my legal education, which I split between the US and France. Uh, and when I was in France, like many French law students, I was doing lots of internships. And I think that's something that I'll return to in, in later comments is the, the importance of internships. But the first of these internships was with uh, General Electric. And my boss there was a former arbitration practitioner at Frère Couder. And he still wanted to have an important place in the arbitration world. So he was publishing articles and arranging events. And I was helping him do this. Um, so he was my introduction to the arbitration world, uh, and he was then my literal introduction to important figures in the arbitration world, including uh, the head of my next internship, with, which was the late uh, Emmanuel Gaillard. So he introduced me personally to him, and, and things rolled on from there. I guess uh, I'm right. I'm still left, right? <laughs> um, I am, um, well... How did I end up in arbitration? Uh, I did the moot as uh, most of the young generation have done, but uh, I am, don't think I can call myself the young generation in arbitration. And especially since uh, Stephen mentioned his gray hair, at least he does have actually some hair. <laughs> um, uh, 
I had a little bit of a different approach than most people in arbitration, especially these days. So I'm not sure this is what people should be following. It was a bit more unorthodox because I started basically serving as GBO secretary. I worked with an arbitral institution, the Ljubljana Arbitration Center, uh, on projects. I was uh, organizing conferences. I was helping out with, with, the, uh, with the new rules, all these kind of things. Uh, but the bulk of my experience uh, came from uh, serving as GBO secretary. And why I did that was I came here to Vienna. Uh, I'm originally from Slovenia. I came to Vienna. I was a PhD student. I uh, didn't have time to look for full-time jobs. So uh, I was focus focusing also on the PhD. Then I was approached by by Jernej Sekolec, who was um, uh, at that time had uh, retired uh, as secretary of Oncetrol. And then he, started, he was... Uh, uh, arbitrator independent practice and then you know I started working on his cases and uh, basically this is how I got into arbitration uh, a little bit I mean more in depth of course uh, but I did the moot many many years ago and I did the an ancestral internship also many years ago <laughs> Uh, we actually have just received the first question from the audience so so in order to encourage more questions I would start with with this question and then we'll proceed to, to, to those which we received earlier. So the question is, what is the portrait of a successful Wilmer, Wilmer Hale arbitration intern? But uh, you may talk about other <laughs> law firms, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I, I will talk about other law firms, but Christina is the portrait of a, a successful Wilmer Hale intern. But the, um, the, I think our internship program and others are looking for people who are, uh, first of all, excited about pursuing international arbitration. I think this is the, one of the ways to break through um, is to have a passion for this. And while one of the cautionary things I was going to say is if you like arbitration, you also should like litigation and, and you should be passionate about different forms and not wed yourself just to arbitration. But being passionate about arbitration and curious about it is, is I think, a really important starting point for any internship in a, in a bigger practice. And then on top of that, uh, what we look for, frankly, is a variety of different things. We look for people coming from certain jurisdictions where we know we're going to have uh, a decent amount of work, but we also look for people who are coming from jurisdictions that don't come up as often because we we, we want to benefit from a diverse and broad range of, of, of uh, people with different backgrounds. So I don't know that there's a, there's one model. I think um, if we want to take a step back, what's what's helpful in terms of being successful as someone um, trying to look for jobs in international arbitration, um, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, being able to write well, is, it's a very heavy um, it's an it's a area of law that relies very heavy, uh, heavily on written submissions, so being able to write well. But for us, the internship program, in part, is a way to start to introduce people, who, particularly people who are not native English speakers, to the, uh, the opportunity to start to develop those writing skills. So I, I, it's not a prerequisite to coming into an inter internship. It's a prerequisite to coming out of it and, and, and capitalizing on the opportunities that the internships give. But I, I think always some academic success is going to be helpful. But I ultimately, I think it's that passion, that real interest coming to do it because you either want to find out about it. You don't have to already know you want to do it, but you really want to find out about it. And then when you're, you are an intern showing that passion and that curiosity. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I think I may just add that how to develop the writing skills if you are still uh, a student, let's say not even the, in, in your master's maybe just to publish more in English and, and, and try to read more in English. Uh, and it comes to cases, to doctrine, to all the commentaries. That's just uh, uh, the tool how you may develop and improve uh, your writing as well. Because I think, and in my experience, I know that uh, uh, to get some internship position, uh, some law firms are requiring to submit a written piece of something that you have already written. So that's your article would be a, a great example uh, to show that uh, you progressed and that you're on, on a level that is required. And I, I did, I, we can come back to this later, how to succeed in those sorts of things. But 
I think that's exactly right. I mean, showing that's one way, that's also one way you show your interest and your passion by looking for opportunities to publish things. And today there are lots of opportunities to do that, not just as a student, but as, as a young lawyer. Uh, I don't want to suggest that English is the, you know, the only language that matters, but if you are doing, if you want to break out of your home jurisdiction or want to get bigger cases, um, showing some facility in English is, I think, for better or worse, uh, a useful thing to do. I think we may move on to the next question. Uh, what hard and soft skills are essential in the field? Are there any pieces of advice on how to develop them? I'm going to jump in because Juliana already gave you an answer to this. It's a it's a, it's a form of litigation, and so you know soft skills I think are around litigation skills. And so you can start developing those litigation skills outside of an arbitration practice. So if you have an opportunity to go to court, wherever you are, if it's 20 minutes to stand on your feet, if it's an opportunity to speak on panels, those are the sorts of skills because it is an advocacy practice. And while I've already said that writing is the most important thing, um, and you've, Christine, have already given a piece of advice about how to work on writing skills. I do think seizing the opportunity to do any form of litigation, and even if you're in a, in a jurisdiction where the form, form of litigation doesn't give you as much advocacy as in, in places with more adversarial systems, starting to, to get exposure to those sorts of things, I think, are critical. Could I maybe just, uh, I saw, oh, sorry, Karina, you unmuted yourself, please go. That's no. I was just going to to add that uh, some 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 of the skills you can uh, you can train them. Some of the skills uh, obviously you need to uh, have, and uh, and and uh, the soft ones at least to develop, start developing them. And one way to do that is to have this experience that most of us had it, which is to um, um, to, to to live in different cultures and live different jurisdictions. Uh, and I think that that comes naturally. You don't have to force yourself, for example, to, to, to develop your social skills because living in different cultures will, will put you in a position, you'll have to do that. Um, so it will come naturally. And one, this is also related to perhaps studying abroad, experiencing internships abroad, uh, uh, tr trying to have a, a more diverse background. Uh, and I think that will help naturally developing, develop your skills. Yeah, completely agree. Um, I would say another um, hard skill would be to develop your analytical thinking, which is essential uh, in uh, any legal practice. Uh, and uh, combine that with good quality legal drafting and good oral advocacy. Um, you can do that basically just um, trying to, to develop your thinking, trying to ask the right questions. Uh, trying to see if you find ways to unpack a factual or legal situation. So you just get to the real questions that are out there. I think this is something that takes time to develop. So you need to, to get the work experience, even if it's not necessarily in arbitration, but it's something that you need to develop because a lot of the times the devil is in the details. Um, another thing uh, which Karina touched on is just effective communication. And... Um, uh, culturally aware and situationally aware communication, which takes time to, to develop, I think. Uh, and by getting involved in, um, so studying abroad, living abroad, getting involved with organizations that include people from various jurisdictions, various backgrounds, um, even the younger ones, so you don't necessarily need to worry about getting into this big organization. I think it's going to be a useful uh, way for someone to to put these, um, to, to get in situations that come up often in an arbitration, which is to be confronted with people that don't think like you, that don't, don't act like you, uh, and they're going to have a very strong opinion about something, and you still need to work with them. So, um, yeah, I think that would be, that would be my advice. I would maybe add that some, uh, Juliana has just mentioned associations. There is plenty of these associations where you can, uh, where you can uh, practice these skills, you can, you can develop them. Uh, I'm not sure if we were gonna mention these things afterwards. Uh, for sure, there's mentorship programs. I had just finished uh, um, as buddy in a two-year mentorship program in, um, of the Young ICA. 
uh, which was really it, it was a very interesting experience. We also had to actually uh, we had we had a participant from Ukraine actually, uh, and uh, basically now you know now in these COVID times most of the actually the meetings were online, but uh, just talking about different arbitration topics with uh, with uh, very experienced uh, arbitrators. Uh, just really brings you uh, a lot of experience in this as well. So I think that would be something to look at. Uh, there's, I know arbitral women have their uh, mentorship program. So that would something also be something to look at. Uh, then I think, of course, um, it really depends on where in your career, at what stage you're right now. Uh, there's plenty of moot courts. Uh, my law firm organizes a moot courts uh, where we... Uh, the participants uh, send in uh, send in some uh, articles. Then we grade those articles. We take the best ones. Then they write. Um, they have a case. Then they have to write a statement of claim or a request for arbitration, and uh, then they plead also. So and then we give the the winner an internship uh, over here in Vienna. And I think this is also a very useful tool. There's there's plenty of these kind of things. So if you just look at a, look at it a lot on the internet a little bit, that would I think bring a lot. Thank you, Peter. I think we uh, now we can move on to the next question, uh, which is, can you name any um, any mistakes young practitioners tend to do at the early stage of their career? Um, put, put, put it differently, uh, looking back into your past as juniors, what would you rather refrain from doing? I will jump in because I haven't spoken so much yet. And I'm going to tie this answer to the previous question. Um, I think an important soft skill and a mistake that people make is not asking enough questions. I think, especially at a junior part of your career, we are concerned uh, about looking as though we are not experts at something, uh, wanting to be confident and showing lots of knowledge. But the truth is no one expects a junior lawyer to come to this profession with a lot of background knowledge and information. Uh, and often I have been in situations with more junior lawyers where uh, the lack of asking questions has actually led to problems, which had those questions been asked along the way, even at the risk of taking up time or being annoying or whatever the case may be, you get to a better outcome. So I would say, the ability to ask questions and to be confident in knowing that you don't have to know everything. That is the confidence. Uh, you are there to learn and to add and to develop. Um, and so if you don't know something, uh, have the courage to say you don't know and you would like some guidance. Thank I would you. So I would say that um, uh, being passive, and this relates uh, to to some so, something that Steve mentioned before, and uh, and you have to seize the opportunities. But uh, being passive in a way that uh, there are there's so much information, as I said, the resources are available everywhere, the opportunities are very available everywhere. There's a lot of competition in the field, um, but just waiting for the opportunities to come to you. Uh, I think that's that's the biggest mistake. You have to pursue them actively. You have to um, make sure that you understand uh, the implications of of, uh, of of different choices that you're going to make. Um, and uh, and of course, with everything, the wealth of resources and information that you have out there, uh, it is expected first of all that one takes advantage of it, and secondly that one one would critically appreciate that amount of information. So I think I think there is, a, and I can see this in, in my children as well. Uh, I, I would not use the term lazy, but it, being passive, I think it's it's one of the greatest risks. And, and for somebody who is in arbitration, which is a very dynamic field of law, where everything changes every day, uh, where you have to keep up with uh, uh, your, your network and, uh, and, and so on, you really, really have to be active. Let me let me pick up on what Thomas and Karina both said, and I, let me put it in terms that are going to sound contradictory, but they're not. You need to. You, one mistake is that people are are don't understand how much time they have because this is a longer term thing, and and so you need to be patient. 
but also persistent, right? So when I say patient, I'm not contradicting Karina, I'm ex- agreeing with Karina, but you need to be patient. You need to understand also how firms hire in this area if you're looking for a law firm job, because there is a lot of, uh, these are, as I said earlier, these are still boutique practices. So you have to understand that the opportunity might not align with your interest, which means you've got to continue to pursue your interest and come back to the firm. So you have to be persistent. You can't try once and then give up, which a lot of people seem to do. You know, they take a stab at it. They get told no, they don't understand. And one of the things you really have to understand is that time moves differently when you're a firm or when you're hiring than it is when you're looking for a job. And this is a a path that may take you years to get there. So you need to keep doing other things that enhance your development while staying very active by being in touch with opportunities, looking out for opportunities and building a network, which as Karina just said, and and as Thomas said before, it's, it's that combination of understanding the timeline, not being overly sort of pessimistic if it doesn't work immediately, being but and being active and persistent without um, giving up too quickly. But also, you know, persistent doesn't mean annoying. Persistent, persistent means smart about reaching out occasionally and developing that work, network, but going back to it. Because one a no this week might turn into a yes two weeks later or two months later or two years later. And you have to keep that in mind. So I could just add something very brief. Uh, there's also the danger of being overly active and overly involved in too many things and just um, not leaving enough time for doing quality work in the projects that we are pursuing. So it's good, it's extraordinary to be active, but also be realistic of what time we can dedicate because there's been so many instances with people taking on commitments and then just not showing up and leaving the others to take on the work. And this this is the, the absolute no-no, I would say. Just don't. If you don't have the time for it, just have the courage to say no instead of leaving a bad impression because I think that's much more damaging in the long term uh, than just declining it because you, you know what time you have and you just cannot commit to the project. Thank you, Juliana. Um, turning back. I, yeah, sure. Sorry, sorry, go, sorry. Go sorry. On, I just wanted on. to, I wanted to take 10 seconds to echo what Stephen has said. <laughs> and um, just to show it to a little bit of an example, uh, you are from a jurisdiction like Ukraine, for example. We, we don't have anyone from Ukraine working at our law firm, but uh, we may get a big Ukrainian case tomorrow. Hopefully, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, so tomorrow we will need Ukrainian people. And I think it works like that in uh, a lot of uh, a lot of law firms that don't have, you know, someone from each jurisdiction. So uh, just keep that in mind when you think: Should I contact uh, them a half a year or late uh, a year later um, uh, when I have some new skills and uh, when I want to try it? Right? Christina, with apologies, I have to jump on this. Peter says he may have a big Ukrainian case tomorrow. I have a big Ukrainian case today. If you are watching and you're an independent Ukrainian lawyer who's young, feel free to reach out to me. So I'm super happy that we are having this round table just because you will get 100 applications, maybe maybe less, but <laughs> right, right today, maybe even tomorrow. Um, so moving on to the next question and turning back to the, uh, to the discussion of international experience. Uh, do you think that uh, LLM in arbitration is is a must uh, for a successful career? And if you do think so, what what schools would you recommend? And also, when is the perfect timing to apply? Either right after the graduation, or maybe wait a little bit, get some experience, and then apply and develop the knowledge you have already obtained. I think I'm expected to unmute myself on this one. <laughs> But I'll, I'll leave Steve go first. Well, I was I jumped in because I, I, I thought you were going to be slightly conflicted on this. I think LLMs are a super complicated issue. And I and I, what I would say is they're helpful. They're not essential. Um, many people come in from other other backgrounds. If you're a Ukrainian lawyer and you're trying to move outside of Ukraine, I think it is it, it does have value. But I think you have to always go into it understanding that there are more people studying arbitration and LLM programs right now, today, than there are new op- new jobs. And so you need to figure out what is the value to me of that that year as a person? What is the, What are the costs? Because they cost sometimes lots of money. And if 
if it doesn't take me to a new jurisdiction, can I bring the skills I've learned back to my home jurisdiction and take advantage of this? I think if all those things, um, if the answer to all those things are yes, they're, they're a great opportunity. And it, it is a, a helpful thing in the hiring process. And if you're coming from a civil law jurisdiction and you're trying to go to a common law jurisdiction, having um, exposure to an LLM program, again, in English, um, and maybe in a common law jurisdiction may expand you, you know, the, the, the selling points you have on your CV to say, I've already thrived in, in um, environments that are different. And if I'm, if I'm looking to work in a practice where there may be um, a broader set of cases that shows I've already done that as a, as a student. So I do think it has value, um, but I think you need to recognize where it, could, where it could take you. And if it doesn't get you to a job in London or Paris, which it increasingly doesn't do, or New York, because there just aren't that many new jobs in these places. That can I go home with it, keep building my practice, and maybe if I want to go to another place in a few years, does it help be a building block in the in the overall picture? But it, does it benefit me as a person and as a lawyer um, when I, if I just go home with it? That, that's my 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 view on it. Karina, you're gonna probably have a different view. No, no, no. I mean, I, I was, I was going to. Um, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll try to sell uh, 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 Stockholm University if there is a need for that. But uh, I, I, the reality is that my first master was in uh, international business uh, at at University of Economic Studies. So in a completely different field, but very much related to to law and and in particular to to commercial law. Um, and that was, uh, and I studied for two years. So I have a master in sciences before I had the master in, in uh, international commercial arbitration law and, uh, and then pursued the PhD. And, and I, I found that extremely useful uh, for the rest of my practice. And in particular now sitting as arbitrator, uh, it was extremely useful to understand the business. Um, it, it gave me a different perspective because I, I studied in a different environment outside the law environment. Um, and, and probably my suggestion is if you are going, if you're planning to pursue a postgraduate degree, because there are different types of degree, you can have a master degree, you can have a, 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 a M field, um, a master in philosophy, you can have a PhD different certificates, different academies and so on. Probably you should focus on something um, first. Why not that complements your other studies? Uh, gives you that, um, I would say, um, distinct point or uh, makes you or put something special on your CV as well as in your uh, uh, developing your professional uh, development as well as in the personal development. And, and whether you should go straight after your law studies or your undergraduate degrees, degree, I would say that at least for more specialized degrees, you would benefit more if you give one, two years of practicing. I think you'll benefit more. It doesn't mean that it's, it's not, you should not go straight after the undergraduate degree. Of course you can, but I think you can benefit more. In particular, as Steve said, if you're going to pay uh, money for that degree, uh, you, should, you should get the maximum out of it. And, uh, and the other point is we should not forget that any studies, any postgraduate studies that you're going to undertake abroad, they bring um, a learning experience that is composed of the, the learning in, in class and the learning outside the class. So the value that you get, it's not only learning about arbitration and, and uh, going into the academic side of arbitration and, and uh, doing research and writing more extensively, but connecting to your peers, building your network, living in a different culture, living alone, taking some time off, developing different skills, uh, managing uh, uh, new situations or unpredictable situations. Um, so all this learning process, it, it, it's very important. But of course, that uh, uh, the rest is a decision that is personal and, and something that you have to think about uh, uh, in the long run. I always tell my students, what do you want? Where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? And if you see yourself somewhere, maybe you should start building your path 
that will lead to the to that point from now in 10 years. Uh, but that path, that point in 10 years can always move. So can be a moving point, can be outside of your range. Uh, so, so do something that you, you're passionate about because we're talking about passion. Uh, even if that's not an LLM in international arbitration, it can be an LLM in something else, uh, a postgraduate degree in something else. To chime in to say <clears throat> that it also depends on the practice that you're targeting. So uh, for example, my first experience at Sherman there were people coming in who had done lots of postgraduate work in arbitration. I, I had not and, and have not really, um, but people are doing PhDs. And I think they tended to like that at Sherman at the time. And there are some practices which are more academically minded um, or at least in their hiring practices, even if the work itself is not any different necessarily from any other firm, some practices do like to have those degrees, but I would say it's perhaps more than just the LLM. Uh, they might have a preference if they're feeling academic towards a PhD, uh, whereas perhaps there might be an inclination on more London-based practices or even UK and US practices based abroad, including in Paris, not to have an inclination towards uh, academic background. So you also have to keep in mind who you're applying to, who you're talking to, what kind of backgrounds they have. And, and to echo on what you on what Thomas have just said, um, the next question relates to a PhD actually and academia academia in general academic work. Uh, do you need a PhD in teaching engagements and do you need to publish a lot on different arbitration related topic to succeed in arbitration? Perhaps I can just complement the uh, question uh, earlier and the answer to this question. I think what Thomas just mentioned is uh, the answer. It really depends where you want to go. Um, if you want to go to, to a big law firm, um, well, if you publish a lot, that might pose some conflicts problems for them uh, in, in various cases. So that might ne not necessarily be seen as a plus. If you want to go and uh, pursue a career in academia, it depends for, for our firm. And just to marry the answer to the question earlier, we always think that um, it's good to have a bit of uh, extra uh, exposure to academic studies and arbitration. But we think, like Karina just mentioned, this is something that you should do after you've already gained some experience. Someone who is too academically minded, uh, who has done an LLM and then perhaps even a PhD uh, immediately after their law degree, uh, it's not going to be terribly attractive to us as a firm because um, we also want to see the practical experience that the person has. The fact that they've worked on cases, they know um, what is expected in, uh, in a law firm environment in terms of how a work product is supposed to look like, how they work in a team. And these are the types of skills that you just um, learn in practice. But that's really specific to our firm. Yeah, if I might, I, 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 I'm echoing what Thomas and, and, and Juliana have said. I think it's not essential and it depends on the firm. It also, all this depends on the timing. You may be the non-academic person who shows up with the right other, the rest of the package at the moment where the person they hired right before you has the PhD. Um, where, where I would think there's value is if you are working in a practice that is mostly giving you domestic litigation and you want to eventually move into a more specialized arbitration practice, showing on your CV that this really is an area that you have some knowledge of and interest in by being parts of organizations, committees, groups, and publishing, and publishing maybe on some things that are outside of your home jurisdiction, just to show to somebody if you're trying to move from Kiev to Paris or, or trying to move out of a, a really domestic litigation practice to show that this is a genuine interest with some, some foundation already in place is I think really helpful. So showing that I think publications can be useful or you know advanced degrees, but publications in particular can be useful just to show that you aren't being opportunistic, but really, really do care about this area and, and give some validity to um, the, the, that claim by showing it on your CV. I would just uh, add on the PhD point uh, uh, because I think that's that's very useful. Um, it, it is not easy to pursue a PhD. Uh, first of all, because uh, the, the places are limited. 
depending on the on the on the universities, um, there is a there is a fierce competition for a, for a PhD candidate position, uh, or it costs a lot uh, to to pursue this. Um, so it's when we say oh go for a PhD, it's not that simple. Uh, it, it, it is easier to pursue a, a master degree, but the PhD you need to invest first of all a lot of time in developing a research proposal that has to be accepted by a supervisor, and depending on the on the on the admission process, uh, uh, also by a committee, and and uh, after that you pursue the the PhD. So I would say that if the intention is to pursue an academic career. Uh, one should invest full energy in, in pursuing a PhD because without a PhD, there is no academic career. Uh, but if the intention is to pursue a PhD, PhD for getting a job with a law firm, you might want to try something else, uh, I would say, and not waste that energy um, or focus on something else. So that has to be studied also carefully. Um, as I said, plan things in advance, uh, do your research, be active. Uh, and see what possibilities and real possibilities are out there. If I may just quickly add uh, to what Karina said, exactly the a PhD is a huge investment. So I would feel bad telling people you should do a PhD so that you would, because I'm not sure they would really be more interesting to employ, even if, when they're from other uh, jurisdictions. Uh, that said, what uh, Stephen has said, maybe the publications, which are, of course, going to take way less of your time than doing a PhD. Um, uh, if you have published something from in the area of arbitration, uh, I don't know, maybe something from your local jurisdiction, how courts deal with something, that is already very, very important. And uh, I mean, sometimes I also look at uh, some CVs and uh, these things uh, do bring you quite some, uh, quite some advantage. Thank you, Peter. Um, I have another question about uh, the current situation, the pandemic. Uh, what would be your tips how to increase visibility of a young practitioner uh, online, first of all, but then offline, uh, if it's possible, uh, at least uh, maybe later this year? Because we know that now we have a pleasure and a luxury of having so many webinars. So the learning experience is amazing. But at the same time, there is not no real connection uh, uh, comparing to live events. So what would be your tips with respect to visibility? Could I perhaps jump in here? I think the, the, the easiest thing is to just uh become a member of a young association, uh, an association for young arbitration practitioners, because they will do events that are tailored to, to junior people where you can meet people who are roughly the same age, you can interact with them, you can learn about opportunities, um, you can organize something like this, you can perhaps speak at an event like this, and this will give you visibility. If you want to make yourself visible to someone who's senior, that's a little bit more difficult, but perhaps one way to do it is like after a webinar such as this one, you can write uh, an email to one of the speakers and introduce yourself, ask an intelligent question. Um, but I think the most intuitive thing, the easiest thing that uh, each one of the students who is listening to us today can do is just sign up for Young ICA, for Young ITA, for ICC YAF, for the Ukrainian Arbitration Association. And you will meet fantastic people like that. I'll jump into the silence and say, you're crazy if you don't do what Yulana, Yulana just said, because there are so many of these opportunities and there's lots of mentoring. Peter mentioned earlier, some of the mentoring um, things, initiatives that are taking place, where it actually puts you together with more senior people as well. But there, it is so easy to be joining the different young arbitration groups and sometimes the, the full arbitration groups. And there's just no, there's no downside to doing it. Um, my sense is that the pandemic has meant a lot of people, including people with my kind of gray hair and gray beard are much more on social media. And there's no downside there either to connecting with people on LinkedIn or things, you know, the, the more professional type platforms. And that doesn't mean harass them, but you can see what they're interested in. It gives you insight into potential uh, practices that you may be targeting. Um, so, there's, uh, you know, reach out to people. No one minds having someone 
a, a young lawyer in any jurisdiction reach out to them. So I think you know th there is a lot of low hanging fruit that you can take advantage of. But then also a lot of the, these groups are really active and you can actually start to build your network. Um, so it's both information gathering. You learn about what's really of interest to the people that you're targeting for jobs and you you um, start to build your network. I just think there's if you're not doing that already, you're, you're making a mistake. The point on asking intelligent questions is, is my favorite one because it applies to everybody. Um, it's something that I incorporate into my practice and I'm sure a lot of people on the panel do as well. If you're not speaking at an event, but you have an interest in what's being discussed, be the fourth panelist, be the extra panelist who asks at the end an intelligent question. And then uh, you have furthered the discussion hopefully, but also you have uh, got a little bit of the spotlight on yourself as well. One of the best pieces of advice I ever heard, this goes to, to the world when we're back having live events, is, is to do exactly that. Because there's this notion that during the coffee breaks, people are going to meet each other. But what people talk about in the coffee breaks, particularly if they don't know people, is the weather or the city that, that they, they're, they're in for the event but don't know. If you ask a question to the panelist, if you're not on the panel, and you ask a substantive question that's not stupid, <laughs> um, but even if it's stupid, um, but particularly better if it's not stupid, it gives people something to break the ice with you when you then have the coffee break. You're the, the man or the woman who asked the question about quantum or whatever. And then, and so the older people who are also looking to, to chat, but don't really just want to talk about the weather, have an opening. You create openings by, by doing what, what Thomas just said. Um, and you can do that online as well. It's harder to bump into people than during the coffee breaks, but uh, you know, we will be back in a world soon where we actually have real coffee breaks and there is an online version of this. Thank you, Steve. Uh, actually, I have a, a very interesting question and I can relate to this question uh, looking back into my past uh, when I was a younger junior, junior associate. So how long does it take to grow from an entry level practitioner to a specialist who can build a position of a client in a case? I think Stephen already answered this in the beginning when he said that you need to be patient and persevere. So don't expect results overnight. So let me let me make one point on this though, but you need to, sh and this goes to everything, Juliana, Thomas, Peter, Karina have been saying, you need to show that you believe in yourself. So you don't overestimate your ability, but from the beginning, own whatever problem, own whatever case you're involved in, have the mentality that if the more senior people get hit by a bus, I know enough about this case. I'm not just focusing on the little piece they asked me to focus on, and then I'm going home as soon as I can go home. Always think about where does this fit into the bigger picture? As, as Thomas said, ask questions, um, and that will help you develop your own thinking around what is it like to be presenting the case in the terms of the question. But it also means the more senior people will start to give you responsibility quicker because they see that you're hungry for it. They see that you want to take it on. They don't, they, they don't see you as someone who just is there to do a job and get out as soon as possible. Um, and so that's it. I mean, thinking always about how is my piece f fitting into the big picture? What would I do if I was the one having to make the, 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 the final decisions on how to approach things, uh, I think is a way to, to keep making sure that you're moving forward. There's no, there's no timeline. We can't tell you it's going to take X number of years, but I think having that mentality is really critical. One thing that I could add, and probably this, this might relate to, to other questions, um, uh, not necessarily in law firms, but also in, as an arbitration practitioner and as an arbitrator, we do see a tendency of, of uh, young partners, young arbitrators, uh, and that's the right thing to do. Um, and one thing that is very important is that we see in the arbitration institutions and in law firms encouraging young talents, as Steve was saying. If you have the passion, if, if you work hard, as I said, don't be passive, be active, uh, uh, be passionate, pursue it. Uh, the fact that you're younger doesn't make you less qualified. And, and uh, I, I can speak, for example, for SSC, where I'm a member of, of the board. Um, the SSC has released uh, um, a few weeks ago the report on the appointment of arbitrators. And if you look at the, at the um, age as one of the categories, there are different categories. There are 
uh, um, analyzed there for the past years, gender um, uh, and, and age. And um, you see that there is a, an encouragement from the institutions to appoint uh, young arbitrators. Uh, so while, while, while you do need some gray hair, uh, I'll keep mine here so you can see it. Uh, and you, you, it doesn't mean that you're, you're less qualified if you're a younger. Uh, you need to, to have the other qualities uh, that will recommend you for a senior position or for an arbitrator. I think that is important. Thank you, Krina. And given that we have only uh, four minutes left, uh, I have a final question. I would like to give the audience a full picture, meaning that every job has its ups and downs. So what is the most difficult part of your job? Thomas? I think the answer for me is going to be different than for many others, or perhaps not. I, I'm now running you know, my boutique practice. Uh, so I don't have the support of lots of admin staff and uh, facilities and et cetera. So I am in charge of everything. Um, and that has not been as big an obstacle as many people uh, warned me about. So I am I'm on top of that, it's under control. Uh, but it, it means that I have to keep my mind on all aspects. I suspect being a partner in a very big practice probably has some similarities in that you are not just thinking about what is the quality of the final work product, but you have to keep in mind uh, managing the team, uh, the finances, a lot of other things that as law students, we wouldn't have ever thought would be part of our daily work. And I'm happy to follow up to say it. This this theme that we that I've run and other people have picked up on about passion is is a reminder also that if you really are all in and and if and to succeed, if people are looking that you at you doing more than just your casework, but publishing and teaching and all the things that we've touched on, this is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Litigation is already unpredictable. You already have, um, you're at the mercy of the other side and the, and the judge or the tribunal and arbitration. Um, things always happen at the same time. You're quiet at the same time and busy at the same time. And if you do things internationally, you may have a client in Asia and the other side might be in, in you know, Peru. Um, there are sacrifices that come to the, out of this. So you really have to like it to put up with the sacrifices because it is so competitive. Um, other people are, are making those sacrifices. And I, you know, I don't mean to sell a bad work-life balance, but you know, balancing it is better if you enjoy it um, because it will be demanding and it will be something that's going to keep you up late at night and make you work weekends. And uh, you know, holidays are going to be missed if you want to do an international arbitration practice. It's really hard to do it as a lawyer um, any other way. I would, I would say that um, I'm fortunate enough to say that there are no difficult parts. No, I'm lying. Uh, there are difficult moments, but uh, I think uh, this, this kind of sum, sums up everything that was said before, which is if you have the passion, uh, as somebody, somebody was saying, if you like what you're doing, you'll never feel like you're going to work uh, a single day of your life. But uh, there are difficult moments. I'm fortunate enough to, to be an academic and to teach the next generations of arbitration practitioners. Uh, so there is a lot of responsibility on my shoulders, but at the same time, an immense satisfaction to see uh, the outcome of, of my work and, and to be happy and, and uh, to be sad, to, to live every moment with, with my students. Um, also to see my research that is uh, used and, uh, and has a meaning uh, in, in, uh, to advance arbitration. Um, as an arbitrator, I, I relate to what Steve is saying. Uh, last two years ago, on 24th of December, I was issuing a procedural order. Uh, and uh, and uh, you have weeks of hearings, and uh, you have to prepare, and you have to accommodate the parties. But I think there are no difficult parts as to say. I think there are difficult moments, but uh, I don't want to do anything else. Perhaps it's difficult sometimes to find time in the day for everything that uh, strikes your passion because you find so many projects that you want to be involved in and it, sometimes it's difficult not being able to take on the projects that you want um, because time is limited and uh, you have to prioritize accordingly. I think that uh, if I may just add, um, 
it really depends on what you are doing. When you're serving as counsel, I think uh, it can happen. It can be stressful. There can be issues with timing. Things come up. Uh, when you're serving as arbitrator, um, things are a little bit different, I think. And uh, uh, Karina, I, I heard what you said right now about that procedure order. I was issuing one, I think, on December 31st last year. I think uh, it was issued around, I think, uh, I think at around 9 p.m. Uh, right after dinner. But uh, I think when you're actually um, working at 4 a.m. as an arbitrator, when you're stressed because you cannot do all these things and it's, everything is like coming up to you, that is exclusively your fault. Where when you're counsel, that it is likely not your fault. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, so now I think it's time to wrap up. And uh, I'm very grateful for all your time that you dedicated uh, to speaking to the audience, to our students and junior associates. Um, now I think I wish everyone a nice evening and hopefully to see you soon offline at some arbitration events, or maybe we will have a chance to collaborate on some matters. Thank you and happy holidays to those celebrating next yeah. week. Thank you, yeah. happy holidays. Thank you, happy holidays. Bye. 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 Bye.